Welcome to everybody. We'll call to order this meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Tennessee Consolidated Retirement System on Friday, December 2, 2022 in the Cordell Hall State Office Building in Nashville, Tennessee, hearing room three of the House of Representatives. I appreciate each of you being here today. I'm David Lillard, Tennessee State Treasurer and Chair of the Board of Trustees of the TCRS. And uh, having called the meeting to order, I'll ask Mr. Wayman, the Executive Director of the System, to uh, call the roll of the members of the Board of Trustees. Thank you, Mr. Barker. Here. Commissioner Bryson. Mr. Cox. Here. Mr. Ellis. Here. Dr. Fisher. Secretary Hargett. Here. Treasurer Lillard. Here. Director Long. Ms. Moore. Here. Comptroller Mumpower. Mr. Stanfield. Here. Ms. Van Hooser. Here. Commissioner Williams. Mr. Wormsley. Here. I'm here as well. You have 10 members present. You can conduct business. All right, Chair declares a quorum to be present. Next item is item three, approval of the minutes of December 2, 2022 meeting. Are there any comments, revisions, issues about those minutes? They're in your packet for review. There are none. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. All right, we have motions there. Second, Ms. Van Hooser seconds it. All right, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, call the roll on the uh, motion to approve. And Mr. Barker. Aye. Mr. Cox. Aye. Mr. Ellis. Aye. Secretary Hargett. Aye. Treasurer Lillard. Aye. Ms. Moore. Aye. Mr. Stanfield. Aye. Ms. Van Hooser. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Mr. Wormsley. And I vote aye as well. It's unanimous. All right. That item is approved. The minutes of December 2, 2022. Next item is item four on your agenda, the Board of Trustee Committee reports. And we'll start with item A, which is the Administrative Committee. Mr. Wayman, the Executive Director of the System, will give the report of the Administrative Committee. Thank you. The administrative committee met this morning at 9 a.m. in room 8D in this office building. We approved the minutes from the September 29th board meeting. Uh, Mr. Joe Walker, the manager of employer participation, provided an overview of the three political subdivisions that are seeking participation in TCRS effective January 1st that we'll take up at a little bit later time. Uh, we also provided the committee with a synopsis of the June 30, 2020 actuarial evaluation and discussed the law enforcement task force meet, uh, that has been meeting. Finally, we heard an update on operations from financial empowerment and TCRS staff. And with that, that's the report of the administrative committee. Okay, any questions, Mr. Wayman, about the report of the administrative committee? All right, seeing none, I want to note for the record here, Commissioner Juan Williams is, uh, has joined us here, and so we'll show him as present today's, in today's meeting and welcome him. Uh, item number B is the next item, the report of the Audit Committee. Mr. Barker is recognized the Chair of the Committee. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we met this morning at 8 o'clock with four of our five members present. Uh, our only action item was to approve the minutes from our September 29th meeting. Uh, other items included a review of the opinion letters from the Comptroller's Office on the GASB uh, uh, requirements. Uh, we also looked at the risk requirement uh, listings. We looked at the internal audit results. That particularly was addressed to the investment division incentive projects. We also looked at the aud audits uh, projects tracker. There are six projects underway there. We looked at the responsibilities calendar for the audit committee. We discussed the comptroller's hotline. There were no uh, referrals to the hotline, and one item that was previously re re uh, reviewed was uh, cleared. We also looked at the internal audit article as a part of our packet, and the title was Mitigating Cyber Security Threats, which we would encourage everyone to look at that in their own organization as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead, and uh, the next uh, under item number five is a committee appointments. And there is one that uh, recommendation that I'd like to make for the audit committee. Uh, Mr. Earl Pierce and I uh, visited over WebEx for candidates that were interested in uh, becoming a member of the audit committee, uh, referring them to the audit committee chair, uh, the charter that the audit committee has, which we reviewed at the last meeting, also the minutes and agenda for from previous meetings. So. 
Uh, after reviewing those with the uh, in persons indicating an interest, uh, I'd like to recommend Mr. Mark Stanfield to become a member of the audit committee with the next meeting. Okay. Uh, any questions of Mr. Barker about the report of the uh, of the audit committee? Uh, we'll take up that recommendation here in the next item when we do the other one. Uh, any questions? All right, seeing none, the next item is item C, that is item 4C on the agenda, the investment committee report. The investment committee did not meet today, so uh, there will be no investment committee report. The next item is item 5, committee appointments, and uh, as Mr. Barker just related uh, on the audit committee, he recommends uh, Mark Stanfill, who is a state employee representative from the Department of Environment and Conservation and member of the Board of Trustees to be a member of the Audit Committee. Uh, also on item number B there in regard to the Investment Committee, I would like to recommend as chair that Tim Ellis, uh, who is Board of Trustee member and City uh, Administrator of the City of Goodlesville, Tennessee, uh, be appointed to the Investment Committee of the TCRS. And I move approval of both of those appointments. Is there a second? Mr. Second. Barker seconds that motion. Is there any discussion of that, that motion to appoint those two members to their respective committees? All right, seeing none, uh, Mr. Director, would you call the roll on the motion to approve both appointments? Mr. Barker. Aye. Mr. Cox. Aye. Mr. Ellis. Aye. Secretary Hargett. Aye. Treasurer Lillard. Aye. Ms. Moore. Aye. Mr. Stanfield. Aye. Ms. Van Hooser. Commissioner Williams? Aye. Mr. Wormsley? Aye. And I vote aye as well. All right, Unanimous. both the appointments of Mr. Stanfield to the Audit Committee and Mr. Ellis to the Investment Committee are approved, and congratulations to each of you. It's a little bit more work, but a lot of satisfaction, so we appreciate your service. Thank you. Next item is item six, political subdivisions seeking participation, and those are listed on your agenda, and I'll ask uh, Mr. Wayman, the Executive Director, to uh, discuss those at this point. Uh, thank you. At, at the audit administrative committee meeting this morning, we heard about the town of Chapel Hill, who is seeking participation in TCRS effective January 1st, 2023, in the legacy pension plan design. They are not offering uh, prior service. Uh, they are requiring employees to contribute 5% of pay, and their initial employer contribution rate is 6.9%, and they are covering uh, we're providing cost of living benefits, but not covering part-time employees. The second uh, entity that's on page 29 of your packet is Houston County. They are seeking participation January 1st, 2023 in the hybrid plan without cost controls. Uh, they are, have 182 employees. Their initial employer contribution rate is 2.3%. They're requiring employees to contribute 5%. They are providing cost of living benefits, but are not covering part-time employees. They are also uh, going to begin participating in the state's deferred compensation plan effective January 1st, 2023. And then finally, uh, the city of Kingsport was the last um, employer that we heard about seeking participation. As a reminder, this entity withdrew from TCRS in July of 2012 uh, in the legacy plan. They are now seeking to come back into TCRS effective January 1st, 2023 in the hybrid plan with cost controls. Uh, as part of this, uh, they, since they've previously withdrawn and are now coming back, they are state statute would require that they can no longer withdraw again from the retirement system. So they are uh, gonna be an employer that's required to continue participating. Their initial contribution rate is 4%. Uh, employee contribution rate of 5%. They have 1,811 employees uh, and they are including cost of living benefits. They also are going to begin participation in the state's deferred compensation plan effective January 1st, 2023. The administrative committee um, made a motion for me to make a motion at this um, board meeting for to accept their, or to approve their participation in the retirement system effective January 1st, 2023 and I make that motion. Okay, and there's a second for the motion from Mr. Wormsley to admit all three of those entities as Mr. Wayman described. The chair wanted to just take a moment and note that with respect to item 6B, the Houston County uh, application to join TCRS, and as uh, Mr. Wayman noted, they're also gonna be joining the defined contribution plans of the state. 
Uh, that's a singularly important thing from my standpoint because uh, they previously have not had uh, employee benefits for their in this regard and for their employees. And uh, I want to particularly single out all of our employees in the Department of Treasury who have worked for a number of years to educate uh, personnel in that county about our services and about these plans and how much good they do for employees. And uh, it's quite a, an achievement that they're joining the system. Also in that same vein, on item number 6C, City of Kingsport, as uh, Mr. Wayman noted, Kingsport is one of the original cities from 1948 that was a member of the retirement system when it was started. And um, shortly after uh, I became treasurer in January of 2009, it became, came to my attention that they were considering withdrawing from the system. And I and Ms. Backus, who was Jill Backus, who was then the director of the system, and Steve Curry, who's the first deputy treasurer of the department, made multiple trips up there to appear before the city council and talk to them about that. And we told them at that time they were concerned about some of the costs and everything, which is very understandable from a local government perspective. And we told them we were going to be designing some new plans and it would just take us two or three years to get those into place and everything. And unfortunately, their timetable wouldn't allow them to wait, so they withdrew from the system. But we continued again working with them and in that same vein as Houston County, I want to commend all of the Treasury Department employees who worked hard over the years to keep in touch with Kingsport and educate them about the plans that we now have available that are very versatile and cost effective for cities and counties and other entities and uh, it's going to do a lot of good and bring great benefits to uh, employees of the City of Kingsport in the future, this action by their mayor and council. So we appreciate them and applaud them for their action. All right, we've got a motion on the floor here in a second. Is there any discussion in regard to the motion? All right, seeing none, uh, Jamie, would you call the roll on the motion to approve all three jurisdictions for admission in the TCRS? Yes, Mr. Barker. Aye. Mr. Cox. Aye. Mr. Ellis. Aye. Secretary Hargett. Aye. Treasurer Lillard. Aye. Ms. Moore. Mr. Stanfield, Aye. Ms. Van Hooser, Aye. Commissioner Williams, Aye. Mr. Wormsley, Aye. and I vote aye as well. Okay. Then, the item is unanimous and they are approved. All right, item number seven is the next time the actuarial evaluation presentation, and we'll hear from Justin Thacker, the actuary for the retirement system. I think punch the button there. Do you've got the button? There you go. Yeah, okay. very good. Thank you. Okay, good morning. I'm here to talk about the actuarial funding valuation work that we do each year for the legacy pension plans. We'll go through a little bit of background, uh, some high-level overview of this year versus last year, and then be sure to answer any questions that you have. I think everybody should have a copy of the presentation there by hand, but it's also on the screen. <clears throat> So establishing what we're doing here, we, we look at information for contribution rates associated with the legacy pension plan. We define a valuation date of June 30, 2022. So that's the date that we collect the data as of for each participant in the plan. We collect the assets as of that date. So even though there's been a little bit of volatility since the end of June, uh, every information, all the information that we're reporting on today uses information as of June 30, 2022. It just takes a little bit of time to gather all of that and then provide a report. But then the contribution rates that we're recommending won't go into effect until July 1 of next year. So you have time for us to get the work done, for you guys to approve the results, and then budget for those into next year. We also take a look at the financial health of the plan with some metrics. And then also point out that this is for funding purposes. I've got a few slides that talk about GASB reporting, but the GASB reporting that we do is separate from the, from the funding valuations. Also, by way of background, we do an experience study, which means uh, there are assumptions that we make about the future as we value these liabilities for the pension plan, whether that be future asset returns, which translates into discount rates or compensation adjustments, mortality. We look at that every four years 
and adjust what we think the future might look like based on the experience of, of your plan. We last did that in 2020. We put those uh, recommended changes in place with last year's actual calculations. So we're gonna stick with those for a few more years and we'll look at those again at the end of 2024. Also every 10 years, uh, an outside actuarial firm is hired to review our work that was last done in 2020, uh, which validated our methods and results. And so uh, again, just like to reference that as a, as a reminder. In terms of the, the group that we're looking at here, we've got a defined benefit system which represents only those employees that were hired before July 1 of 2014. If you'll recall, uh, Treasurer was referring to some of the changes that were made with regard to political subdivisions. Around the same time, substantial changes were made for new hires into the state and teacher plans. And so those are in a separate report, a separate meeting discussion. This is for everybody that was hired before July one of 2014. We also look at over 600 of those local governments. Um, they have optional opportunity to join the plan and they have various options. Some include the hybrid options and some include the legacy options. For this purpose, we do include the, all of the local governments regardless of which plan they're in for purposes of looking at some of these aggregate totals. But there are 162,000 active participants in the legacy plans that number was 167,000 last year, which means 5,000 people uh, terminated from active employment. And since all new hires are going into the hybrid plan, this plan does not experience any new hire activity. So we're just going to watch the active participant counts decline over the years. And ironically, I guess not really ironically, it makes sense, there was 170,000 retired participants last year, and this year there are 175,000. So we're watching the active participant group move into the retired status uh, throughout the rest of their remaining lifetime. About just over 60 billion in assets uh, from a market value perspective for the legacy plans and including the political subdivisions as of June 30, 2022. And that's what we're working with to set our calculations for a recommendation for next year's funding requirements. I won't spend too much time on this. I'd just like to keep this in here as a reminder of the differences between the legacy plan and the hybrid plan. Effectively, the hybrid plan, as the name implies, has a defined benefit and defined contribution portion associated with it. So there's a 5% employer contribution to a DC plan. And then associated with that is a smaller pension benefit that has a slightly, uh, um, longer eligibility requirement to be eligible for the pension benefit, but all of it works together to provide this hybrid, hybrid benefit for the hires after 2014. The other key components is the hybrid plan has a stabilization reserve component to the annual contribution and um, has the ability to re uh, reduce benefits with cost controls if it's ever necessary with the contributions if they become outside of the budget range. So. And this page really just summarizes the fact we've already talked about um, the hybrid plan. But the main point being is that the legacy plans are going to be around a while. It's 162,000 actives, 175,000 retirees. And I've got some slides at the end that will show just how long they'll be around. But this legacy plan is not going anywhere anytime soon. And so we need to make sure we take good care of it and fund it properly. So looking at some of those numbers, I mentioned 162,000 active employees in the legacy plans. This shows you how that breaks down. So there's uh, almost 50,000 teacher active employees and uh, almost 30,000 state active employees. And you'll see they're declining year over year because the new hires are going into the hybrid plans. The political subdivision number is actually growing because this includes all political subdivisions regardless of which plan they've selected. So there's no declining a uh, active population as those groups are growing or more groups are coming into the system. We would expect that number to continue to grow. This shows a total compensation of each group. Um, you have to be careful what information you glean from this, like the average compensation that's shown there is probably a little bit higher than you might think an average employee is making in, in the grand scheme of things. And that's simply because this only represents people that were hired before July 1, 2014. 
Uh, this is the more experienced group that's remaining, the older, more experienced group that have been in the system a little bit longer. So keep that in mind before making any, drawing any conclusions about some of these numbers. But it just gives you a sense of the magnitude of the total compensation of each group and in total that we're working with here. This is the retired group. We mentioned there was 175,000 this year, so you can see that column there in the middle that shows the breakdown. And the difference is, is even though the teacher group had significantly more active employees, the state group actually currently has more retirees, which is, again, just a more of a legacy uh, situation there. The teachers tend to work a little bit longer. So there's more state employees that come in and then retire sooner, so there's a lot of different things going on there. But um, just interesting interesting to note. And then the total retirement benefit also, um, we, there's a $3 billion of total retired payments each year that, that come out of the system that go into the hands of former state and teacher employees. And you can see, I'll, I'll point out one thing, the average benefit amount there, so the average benefit for the typical teacher retiree is 26000 per year. The average benefit for the typical state employee is almost 17000 per year. They have the same benefit formulas. There's no differences in terms of the benefits that are being offered. It's just that the teacher group behaves differently. They tend to, like I said earlier, they tend to work a little longer in the system. And so when they retire, they have more years of service to calculate for their pension benefit, which tends to create a bigger benefit. It's not as though the benefit is any different. It's just the data that goes into that calculation creates a bigger benefit, which means the teacher group tends to have a bigger liability for us to track and monitor, which you'll see in a minute. And then the growth there in the average benefit generally is tracking the 3% uh, cost of living adjustment that the plan paid this year at the, uh, June 2022. It's a little bit different than that because it's an average of people coming in and out of the group, but that's approximately what's going on there. Okay, so we talked about the data that we collect as of June 30 and some stats about what goes into our calculations. The other really important piece of the work that we do here is how to coordinate the liabilities that we calculate with the assets that you currently have on hand. And the assets by far are the most volatile piece of the calculation that we, that we work with. We can set long-term expectations, long-term assumptions that are reasonable about what we think the assets will return. But in any given year, and I'm sure you all see this in your own uh, personal balances as well, it's anybody's guess what any one year is over the other. So we want to manage that and make sure that that volatility doesn't create a budget problem for managing the contribution expectations. So we take any uh, asset volatility in any, in any given year and we smooth that. We call that a smooth method, actual value of assets. And we take asset gains and losses and spread them over 10 years so that if there's some big volatility in one year, and you'll see in a minute, we've had a couple of those years, um, that we give it time to work through the system before we fully reflect it in case it happens to reverse itself. So um, we also have some corridors in place to make sure that we never get too far away from the reality of what a true market value is, but our method tries to smooth as best we can uh, the asset volatility so that it doesn't roll into the budget. So this page has a lot, there's a lot going on here, but I'll walk you through a couple of highlights. So the top section where the, the numbers are listed shows the actual return that the system reported in any given year over the last 10 years. And as you can see, if you look across the very top row, there's only one year that was actually negative. That was 2022, where the, the system lost 3.6%. However, there's actually four different years on the chart below that shows a loss in terms of our market value of asset smoothing method. And that's because in 2015, 16, 19, and 20, even though the asset return for the plan year was positive, it was still just a little bit less than what we had assumed the, the long-term assumption uh, for that given year. So for example, you look at 2015 and 16, the plan returned about 3% in each year. We were assuming 7.5% at that time. So that represented a loss of four to 5% in those years versus what we were budgeting for or expecting in our, in our methods. The other thing to point out is that the last two years makes everything prior to that look uh, very minimal. <laughs> uh, we were managing those gains and losses uh, all the way up until 2020. 
2021, and we had this huge 26% return during 2021, which was great. And our method said, okay, that's great, but we're gonna only recognize 10% of that this year, just in case that doesn't hold true. And then the next year, we, um, there was a bit of a correction, but if you'll notice, the, the size of the loss in 2022 is still smaller than the gain in 2021. So the 2022 loss really hasn't hurt us at all because we're still phasing in the gains from 21, and what we're accepting is the phase in from 21 is still in excess of what we're phasing in the loss of 22. So we really have some pretty good stability here to show you today as opposed to um, significant volatility from the two years. So the method's working, that's, that's the main point. This shows you um, the asset value that we use for our calculation purposes is the light gray line, if you can see that color there. And then the market value of assets is the blue line. So if you start on the left-hand side of the page back in 2008, 2009, you can see the market value was significantly less than what we were using in our funding calculations because we knew at the time and our, our method would allow us to slowly make up for those losses. So the gray line was much more stable as the market value caught up to what we were using. And then we've been bouncing around pretty close for the last several years and then last year it shows where the market value shot up really high, but we didn't reflect it all. And then this year it's come back down. The method, the number that we're using is very close to the actual market value. So again, the method's working. And when we come up with our contribution recommendation, we look at um, a couple of different components. We have what we call normal cost, which is the amount of benefits that are being earned in any given year by all participants in the plans. We wanna make sure we fund for those. And then to the extent that there is any uh, unfunded liability we, from past benefits that have been earned that the assets aren't properly covering just yet, we wanna make sure we slice an amortization piece off to cover those. So that's effectively how we are coming up with our recommendation each year. Um, there's some flexibility that we have to, um, to manage those amortization periods for unfunded accrued liabilities to help again manage some stability in the budget. And we can talk about that a little bit in a minute as well. This page is really a, a graphical representation of how we come up with our recommendation. And really I just wanna highlight a couple of small things. The, the total size of each bar represents the total future obligations that we believe each plan represents. Uh, to the state, and the, the gray bars at the bottom represent the assets that are currently on hand. So you can see the plans are very mature. There's a significant amount of funding already in place. Um, the pieces at the very top are really the only pieces that represent how we come up with the future needs of the plan and the future contribution rates. Um, so that's good. There's a, there's a lot of good things to say, say there in terms of the funded status of the plan. And, uh, also shows that it's gonna be very sensitive to asset swings. If, if those assets uh, drop significantly, then it's going to flow through the contribution rates. But again, we have these smoothing methods in place to try to manage that. So you might ask, how are the plans doing? What's the financial health of the plan? So funded status is a good measure of that. This shows the differences in funded status between 21 and 22. Now this is the actuarial value of assets, the smooth value of assets. This doesn't fully reflect all the gains and losses of the last two years. This is what we're tracking for purposes of our contribution rates. In this purpose, you can see that each plan, each subsection improved in funded status year over year. And again, that's because the losses that we're reflecting this year on the assets, we're only reflecting a portion of those and we're still bringing in more gains from last year's gains that are offsetting that. So why, that's why the funded status improved for each group on an actuarial value basis. And again, total system went from 97% to 98% funded status, which is really good. On a market value basis though, if we look at that, that's where we're going to see the volatility. That's where the true movement in the assets is going to be reflected. And this is what shows up on the GASB disclosures, GASB 67 and GASB 68. And here you can see that last year, the funded status uh, for the total group of each section shot up to about 111%. Again, a 25 or 26% asset return will do that. Um, and then we gave a little bit of that back in 22. So 
the funded status for the for the total group still drops down to about 100 and each group has their own uh, history of why the funded status is a little bit different but all are very good compared to most other plans in the nation um, so TCRS and the state of Tennessee should be commended for making sure that these plans are properly funded through good times and bad so this is a good this is a good indication of that so I won't spend too much time on this but I talked a little bit about the amortization periods that we can utilize to help manage stability for the unfunded liability portions of the plan. The teacher group doesn't have any unfunded accrued liability, but the state group and the judges group has a small amount, and those amounts are being amortized over, uh, the state group is being amortized over a seven and a half year period, the judges group is being amortized over a five year period. Again, that is much more conservative to pay down those unfunded liabilities than most other uh, governments. Many plans across the country are using a 30-year amortization or they may reestablish a 30-year like a refinancing your mortgage every year and they're never actually making progress. And so again, this is another good measure of, of how well the state is taking care of making sure these plans are properly funded. I won't make you listen to me go through this page, but this is just a breakdown. We actually show gains and losses of every single year since 2013 and each individual year has its own amortization period. There's really nothing too exciting to see here. Um, okay, so jumping forward to the, to the results, the actuarial recommendations of each group shows the teacher group declining a little bit from 2021 to 2022. We had pretty good stability in the results from one year to the next, but the main reason that this teacher group declines this year is because of those amortization periods that we talked about there was one year, in fact, you can look at it, it's year number 2017. That particular amortization layer was fully paid off last year. And so the amount that was in the actuarial recommendation to help cover that row of the amortization period has now gone to zero. So it drops the contribution rate a little bit um, in order to, uh, to reflect the fact that that amortization in peace is gone. So the teacher group drops a little bit, but then there's a significant amount of stability from one year to the next for the state group and the judges and attorneys generals. These represent the recommended contributions as a percentage of payroll. Uh, given that the total payroll is declining each year because no new employees are entering the group, we also like to look at it in terms of total dollars. So the total dollars expected uh, to be contributed to the plans are actually declining to help to, to mimic the decline in the total payroll uh, because the contribution percentages were pretty similar. So it, it, this is a representation of what the total dollar expectations are within each, within each group. And then I'll spend just a couple of minutes talking about the, the movement of going from two, 2021 to the 2022 results. Just, I'll highlight just a couple of these. Um, the asset experience row is a negative number, which means it was putting downward pressure on the contribution rate. Again, that might seem unusual in a year when there was significant asset declines, but it all goes back to our smoothing method and how we were recognizing more gains from 2021 still to offset those losses in 22. So that's why there was still downward pressure on the contribution rate. We're still benefiting from 2021's gains and will so for another eight, eight more years. Most of these other items show that the, the variability from one year to the next in our assumptions was pretty small. You know, for example, the cost of living, the third row there, it shows a slight increase in the contribution rate. That's because the, contra the uh, cost of living adjustment that was granted in June of 22 was 3%, but the plan is capped at 3% regardless of, um, regardless of the volatility out in the marketplace at this point with inflation. And our assumption is a little bit less than 3%. Our long-term assumption uh, is a little bit less than 3%. So therefore, there's a little bit of a loss reflected from one year to the next in terms of our actual calculation. We just adjust each year based on what actually happened and then move forward from there. Um, the middle section of the page, you can see a line item related to a $250 million contribution. The General Assembly allocated $250 million of extra funds to the state plan last year. And so that had a 1.3% reduction to the state contribution rate. And then effectively that is reversed at the bottom, bottom row there. And the reason is because we already took that, 
we already took that last year. We went ahead and made adjustments to the results last year to reflect that anticipated amount coming in to help offset the impact of some of the assumption changes that were being made that were more conservative. And so this year we reflect that it actually came into the system in the last 12 months, but um, we already had adjusted for that in the contribution rate last year. But overall, you can see there's not a lot of uh, variability here from one year to the next, even though there's a, a lot of different items that really sum back up to the um, minimal change. This is just a history of where the contribution rates have been, both in the state and the teacher groups over the years. You know, you can see the, the late 80s and 90s when the contribution rates were declining, uh, and then it's been a steady climb since then. But um, again, the plans are in very well-funded status position and, and uh, appreciate the state's um, care in making sure that that continues. With regard to future expectations, we talk about this each time, but it's, you know, we make assumptions about the future. We do what we think is a, we set what we think are reasonable assumptions, but well, we don't know, right? So as we continue to monitor assumptions with mortality, uh, compensation adjustments, discount rates, long-term returns, we'll continue to monitor those, but those could have impact on the plan going forward. But we do also think that our, cons our assumptions now with regard to mortality and investment return are more conservative than they were several years ago and should still provide some stability, even if, um, even if we see some different results in the future. Okay, last few slides. This is really just a, a summary of let me explain a little bit what this is so you know what you're looking at. This represents the total number of people in each plan today versus where we see the total numbers projecting out over the next 80 years. So you look at the bottom, you can see the total number of participants, 114,000 people. That's adding the actives and retirees together. This is the teacher uh, group alone here. That's adding the actives, retirees, and also some inactives that are in the system who've not yet started their payments but have no longer that no longer work for the teacher group. And it shows each of their age groups. So for example, you can see that there, the lines are flat up until about age 30. So that represents the fact that we haven't really hired anybody new into this plan since 2014. So everybody that's in the plan is largely 30 or over. And then you can see there are 20 to 25,000 people in the age 30 to age 70 or 80 group. So there's a pretty good group of people at all ages between 30 and 80. And then there's a smaller group of people that are between 80 and 100. And this, again, this includes the retire group. So we project out when will these people retire? Uh, when will the retirees um, go through the end of their life? And you see that 20 years from now, we expect the group to go from 114,000 people to 73,000 people. So 20 years from now, we're still going to be talking about a group that's got 73,000 people in it. So this is a slow process. And we believe that it'll take maybe 80 years for the group to completely be no longer having a need to have these conversations. So um, I'll be sure to answer any questions in 80 years <laughs> if, uh, if these projections don't pan out. <clears throat> So for the, for, the uh, for the state group, it's very similar. It's a slightly different shape. There's just a different demographic of people that were hired into the state group. But you can see a similar event. There's a peak, really, of people in their 50s and 60s in the state group. Looks a little bit different than the teachers, but you can still see them moving through the system. And again, um, 70 or 80 years from now, we expect this plan to, to wind down. So but until then, we've got a, we've got a ways to go. Last two slides. You can see the blue line represents the total number of participants that we were talking about on the previous page. You can see the blue line declining over, the, over this period of time. The liabilities in the plan represent the orange line. And so for the teacher group, the liabilities are expected to still grow a little bit as, as employees are still earning service, there's still time, benefits that are still growing. And then eventually that liability will start to decline. So we're, we're, on, we're on the path to see that happen. The state group on the next page looks a little bit different. So it's a similar number of people, so the blue line looks pretty similar. But the liability is a little bit lower. We talked earlier about why the state group liability is a little bit lower. But the other interesting thing is, is that the state group has already peaked. 
like the liabilities for the state group have plateaued and then will start to decline a little sooner than the teacher group. So um, again, just to, uh, I think it's a, it tells a good story about the changes that were made to the plans were very effective for long-term budgeting, but these plans are still gonna be around a while in order to manage and, and fund them properly. So that's all I have from prepared remarks. I would like to say, I, uh, very coming through the Thanksgiving holidays, I'm very thankful and appreciative of the opportunity that our firm has to work with you. We, we appreciate that. Uh, every, this Treasury staff and everybody on the Treasury staff is so great to work with, and it's both a pleasure and an honor to serve this board. So thank, thank you for that opportunity. So I, I'll answer any, any questions that anybody might have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thacker. And uh, I just want to point out in furtherance what Mr. Thacker said, uh, you know, it's, it's most people don't understand how much work the actuary for a system does in terms of uh, maintaining the system and furthering its interests and uh, determining its future course. And that's certainly been the case with Justin Thacker and his colleagues. He's with USI Consulting now, but his, his predecessor firms as well, you know, by the consolidation that's occurred over the years. But he does other things, for instance, um, you know, that he serves during the year, like we have the task force, for law enforcement task force going on right now, and he and his colleagues have done a lot of work doing projections for that and uh, doing actuarial calculations for the possible conclusions of that report. And that's to say nothing of the uh, 500 and something uh, local government reports that have to be done, as each of you knows, the local government entities that are in our retirement system are valued separately. They're their own liability pool. Each one of them is. And so the actuary has to prepare a report for each one of those. And each one of those requires, requires that high standard of professional care that Justin and his colleagues bring to every endeavor. And it's quite an undertaking. So we want to thank you, Justin, for what you and your colleagues do for us uh, as part of the system. Does anyone have any questions of Mr. Thacker about the actuarial evaluation report and presentation that he made? All right, seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the report. Mr. Barker moves it, is there a second? Oh, we have a second by Commissioner Williams. All right, any further discussion on that matter? All right, seeing none, Mr. Wayne, would you call the roll on the motion to approve and adopt the report? Mr. Barker. Aye. Mr. Cox. Aye. Mr. Ellis. Aye. Secretary Hargett? Aye. Treasurer Lillard? Aye. Ms. Moore? Aye. Mr. Stanfield? Aye. Ms. Van Hooser? Aye. Commissioner Williams? Aye. Mr. Wormsley? Aye. And I vote as well as unanimous to adopt the rates. All right. The actual evaluation report and presentation is adopted. Thank you very much, Mr. Thacker, and thank you for your work, as we said. Our next item is item five, the investment report of the system. We'll call on our Intrepid Chief Investment Officer, Michael Brakebill, Chartered Financial Analyst. He has with him Thomas Kim, who is Deputy Chief Investment Officer, CFA, who is also here. So, Michael, you have the floor. Thank you, Treasurer. Good to see everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to re review two things, the investment performance report that you have in your packet, and then um, kind of my market and update slides is kind of what's happened since uh, peace. Uh, uh, generally, your investment performance report is going to be reviewed by the, the pension consultant, Veris. They, they typically come here twice a year and just give you a sense of the timing. That would be a March and September, and that therefore they could review uh, fiscal year and calendar year numbers. So, the, so we really focus on that. And they can also come in for different periods um, as, as needed or if we have something else at the, at the investment committee. Um, and just uh, refresh your memory on that. Margaret Jadala retired. She's been with us for a number of years. And Mark Brubaker is, is, is going to be taking over uh, our reviews and everything. And I uh, definitely wish her well on her, uh, her retirement. Um, again, on this report, it's essentially three sections. There's one that's market overview economy, kind of boilerplate data. That's in the front part. Then in the center, there's uh, a, a section on the entire portfolio, assets, et cetera. And then in the back, there's more detailed stuff on the individual pieces of the portfolio. 
I'm going to go look uh, at uh, and take you all to page five, which is uh, the asset allocation chart, just to give you a sense of how the portfolio looks. Uh, the big table on the top right shows uh, $59.27 uh, billion. Dollars. Um, just in simplistic terms, the path we have been on prior uh, to uh, the COVID crisis, the pension was about we're almost exactly 60. In the bottom of the pandemic fear at March 31st, 2020, we hit 45. Last December, December 31st, we hit 70, and then we tailed back off to 60, where we where where this is. We've done a little better since. We're about 63 uh, as of yesterday's close, and um, which is about 9% off of last December 31st. So that's in a ballpark, real simple numbers, the path that the fund has taken. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out to you on this page is if you go to the center table on the far right, you'll notice uh, what that shows you is it shows you the differences in the portfolio versus what's in investment policy. The key thing to note there is that uh, the big differentiation in returns this past year have been public liquid markets. Stocks and bonds did really badly, and alternative assets did pretty good. And so what that has done is we were moving our alternatives up to the 10% target, which is the target column. The actuals are larger, and the reason the actuals are larger is those asset classes did much better this past year. And the other asset classes, stocks and bonds, did less well. So it made that skew. It's not something we intentionally did. It just kind of, it's a market pull on its own. Um, on the next page, on page six, uh, this is the overall table of investment returns, uh, minus 9.88% for the trailing year as of September the 30th. Um, that's better than about 64% of plans. It's okay. 3%, 596, uh, and then the five and 10 years where, again, like Justin mentioned, it kind of smooths out, 7.38% for 10 years, so it's pretty good numbers overall. And this page highlights what I was discussing a moment ago uh, about um, how publicly traded markets did really badly and private markets did well. If you go look on the one year trailing, so this is September 30th, 21 to September 30th, 22, the uh, US stocks were down 15.48, Canadian stocks 11.83, International developed stocks, so the euro fell and their stocks did badly, so down 2770, and emerging markets down 22. The interesting thing about the emerging market piece is since our portfolio doesn't include Russia's, or Russia and China, but China specifically, that minus 22% actually beat the MSCI emerging market index by 8%. So as bad as that is, it did much better because we don't have China holdings in there. And even the one below that, if you look at U.S. fixed income, the dramatic rise in interest rates have been what we've been living through this past year. So our fixed income portfolio is down 20.92%. So even the stock the bond portfolio was down a lot. We have a lot of duration in our bond portfolio. We take a decent amount of risk with the notion that it's a long-term game. And, and so it was off a considerable amount. So those are all the publicly traded listed securities, basically. And then below that, you'll see real estate. Real estate was up 30 and a half percent. Private equity was up four, so okay, not great. And then strategic lending, our, uh, our risky bond portfolio essentially was up 140. So, so there's huge gap and a huge differentiation with really real estate being the place to be. And again, uh, to, for clarity, the um, liquid, Portfolio numbers are as of September 30th. The real estate, what we show you is we have uh, asset values as of September 30th, but the returns are as of June 30th. So that, that 30 and a half is actually a June 30 to June 30. That's a, a traditional way to report um, illiquid asset classes. And private equity is the same. So that is, that's the key thing I wanted to bring up on the um, investment performance reports. Um, a tough period, um, you know, we have, as Justin showed, 
just a few negative years over a long period of time. You know, um, the treasurer and I have, yeah, have had the explicit pleasure of living through a number of those, so uh, that's been a fun, fun thing. And, and, but at the same time, we had our 26% return from last year, too. Um, I'm going to pull up the Moving on to um, kind of how the world looks right now and talk about inflation and growth and valuations in the current portfolio. Um, make sure I can do this. Ah, yes. One of the outcomes of the financial, of the pandemic was a dramatic drop in interest rates. And when that occurred, a lot of money moved into assets and created a lot of asset inflation. You saw it in tech stocks and you also saw it in housing. And we've been watching housing closely to see how it changes. And this chart um, shows the, uh, it's not the decline in housing, but the, the easing in the growth rate of housing <coughs> on an annualized basis, which has been, um, it's good to see. This is one of those things that for the world to normalize for the Fed to quit raising interest rates, you have to see these numbers, uh, you have to see this soften. So we, we've all seen in our homes and neighborhoods uh, that what the dramatic rise in interest rates from 3% mortgages to 7% mortgages, what that means, and this is, a, is, is an indication of that. So housing is moderating, that's a good thing. Uh, goods um, on the next page are, um, this is one I've shown you, um, over the past few years, which is the pipeline of inflation. You, the intention here is to show goods inflation from crude goods on the top to core CPI on the bottom. And it's kind of the pig and the python concept where you have the core inflation has come off pretty dramatically. It's actually negative year on year crude goods, down 4% uh, as of Octo uh, Halloween. Um, and then the core PPI intermediate goods are coming off, still up at 5%. But you should see all of these things flow through to the core PC, uh, CPI to, to moderate it. it, it you know, may, we may see some changes, but, or may see some hiccups there. But right now, that looks promising. This, uh, this graph is a, one of the things I've been, I think, is one of the most interesting things that has occurred during the pandemic, which is, we had long-term trends in the economy that the pandemic totally upended. <coughs> Specifically, our economy was going where people's expenditures were moving more and more and more towards services and less and less towards goods. The blue line on the top is the PCEs for, um, for, uh, for goods, and the red line is the PCE as a percentage of, of expenditures for goods. And so what's happened over a long period of time is people spend less and less on goods. But during the pandemic, on the right there, you can see that totally upended. Basically, people were stuck. They couldn't get on an airplane. They couldn't go on a vacation. They went out and bought bicycles, kayaks, whatever. And that's why you saw the, the, the blue line, which had been declining for years, take a dramatic step upward. Similarly, the services, you couldn't get on a plane or anything, that came off dramatically. And so we're in this post period of post pandemic where that's normalizing and we should see this normalize over a period of time. And it's gonna take a while, but that is an underlying phenomenon that we should keep track of. Another thing on inflation has been employment. Uh, I don't have anything for the job report today that came out, which jobs were pretty solid. Um, what I've been watching, this is a more near-term thing that we, that we keep an eye on called initial unemployment claims. It comes out weekly. Uh, weekly's on Thursday. I had been watching it closely to see it turn up uh, in the box on the very far right and kind of did a little bit of a head fake. Um, it still um, hasn't risen. If it rises, it means the labor market is weakening which takes pressure off of inflation and pressure off the Federal Reserve to continue to raise rates. It stayed pretty solid. Today's job report um, that we saw, 
the 3.7 percent unemployment and I think 263,000 jobs is that what that one was it was a good number but it's interesting it the unemployment rate only failed two tenths of a percent from December the 31st to this last update so that's pretty stable um, and uh, and pretty much moderating moving to growth because I think one of the things that's going on is we're moving investment markets are moving from being concerned about inflation to being concerned about growth. We still haven't, it's not, we're, we're not too afraid of that right now, but that's what's kind of coming right now. This really messy, ugly chart is all of the Federal Reserve's regional indexes or the main regional indexes, just to throw all of them on one page to show you how busy everything is and the pieces of data we all see and the story it's telling. The big downtrend to the, in the, in the right, um, uh, a bit is is obviously the the pandemic when the, the world kind of came to a stop, and you can see we had a dramatic increase, our good solid increase for some period of time, and then all of these regional indexes have been declining, and uh, so on the whole you can just eyeball that and see how Philly Fed, Chicago Fed, Kansas City Empire, uh, Richmond Fed, Dallas, etc., all of those business surveys of act activity by the Federal Reserve have been declining, which is bad in terms of the economy slowing, but it's also good because it takes pressure off the Fed. We need this to happen. It's just hopefully it doesn't happen too dramatic and too quickly. It does raise questions and concerns about recession and what that will mean. Um, this last, this chart I have here on uh, treasury market indicators is one that uh, my fixed income team uh, started really watching and, and pulled up, which is, um, a lot of people focus on the yield curve, which is a great thing to focus on and reflect uh, uh, on how it reflects expectations about the future. There's been a lot of discussions about how um, long-term interest rates now are lower than short-term, like one or two-year interest rates, and how that implies the recession is imminent. This is the same concept, but a little different indicator. And what it is, is we take the forward interest rate three-month T-bills two years from now and subtract it from the current one. So if current rates are higher, that means it's negative and um, it basically implies they're slowing going forward. And I've done this over a long period of time since 1996 to now the gray bars that are kind of slightly gray, there are recessionary periods. And uh, every single time in the past since 1996, 95, that that indicator has gone negative. We've had a recession. The only time it didn't, if you'll notice on the far left, was the Asian financial crisis. That was a very interesting period because that was really a slowdown that occurred where our economy was still pretty strong and the Federal Reserve eased and our rates came off based on things that were happening internationally that, that and, and, and so that may be a bit of a spurious thing, but that one indicator, there wasn't a recession, but you'll see in each one of these other cases, you know, the tech bubble years, uh, the, the um, uh, financial crisis, and then uh, in the, in the uh, uh, prelude to the uh, uh, COVID, uh, the pandemic, we've had a, a recession that's followed this decline in rates to negative levels. So, so we're watching this closely. It's not a, something to be afraid of, but it's, it's definitely something to be on everyone's radar, that economic activity, it's good right now, it feels like a good period, but it could slow going forward. Um, and valuations, uh, uh, you know, as investors, we, gotta, we need to look forward and say, well, okay, what does the world look like and how? Valuations have corrected a lot uh, off the peak. Um, the, you know, the prior peak was basically just a little more than a year ago. So, um, uh, you know, I was very nervous at the time and markets look, look pretty heady. You never know uh, what's, what's gonna happen. But, you know, we did have that correction in valuations and you can see the median PE went from a pretty high valuation to, to more modest. It still looks elevated versus the long term, but it's much better than it had been a year ago. Um, the, the kind of one area that looks better than it has in a long time are, are bonds. Um, 
you know, our bond portfolio had took a tough hit last year, of, uh, definitely. Going forward, um, it's, it's actually one of the best periods for many, many years. It'll, you'll see if you go across at 5%, you have to really go back to prior to the global financial crisis for yields to be as attractive as they are now. So that's, that's a good thing to see. Um, and it really helps us out. And, you know, one of the key things that had occurred was super low interest rates made it difficult to imagine how we were going to meet our objectives. You know, this looks better now. Um, and the portfolio, um, again, we have uh, $59.3 billion in the performance report as of uh, September 30th, that's done a little better to 63. We had a you know great day, a uh, great few days here recently. Uh, real estate is about eight billion dollars, private equity 8.3, and strategic lending about six. So, so a pretty good number overall. Little a little uh, positive for the fiscal year. Uh, we're kind of having a little softness today, but it's kind of a trivial, trivial thing. So that's that's the way the portfolio and the economy and the outlook looks. And I appreciate any questions anyone ask so thank any you questions much. or uh, discussion points here in regard to mr. break bills uh, report uh, well thank you for that investment report Michael okay mm -hmm. and thank you for what you and uh, Thomas Kim and the other members of the investment staff do for us uh, thank you. you do a whole lot of work for the system to uh, keep us rolling so we appreciate that mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, the next item is item 10, which is other business. And I wanted to mention uh, the, um, that we have underway the law enforcement task force. Uh, in the last General Assembly session, um, several bills on retirement that would have made changes to the system were combined and made into a study bill that mandated what we call the law enforcement task force that has been meeting for the last few months. Uh, it's comprised of uh, Chairman Bo Watson, who's a senator, who's chair of the Senate Finance Committee, and who's co-chair, and also uh, Patsy Hazelwood, who's chair of the House uh, Finance Ways and Means Committee, is the other co-chair. I serve on it, Mr. Wayman does, along with other members who represent law enforcement people from state agencies, for instance, uh, uh, park rangers who, who have a law enforcement authority and uh, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, also we have local government law enforcement representatives on this task force as well, representing the Tennessee Sheriff's Association and the Chiefs of Police Association. And I wanted to alert you about that because we're coming down to the last two meetings or so of that task force. Uh, one of those two meetings will occur today at 1 p.m. here in the Cordell Hall building. And those meetings uh, are uh, streamed live on our website, the TCRS website and the Treasury Department. And, Jamie, you want to tell them about where they can find that on the website? Hey, yes, sir. So if you go to the Treasury website, treasury.tn.gov, if you'll navigate there to explore your Tennessee Treasury and then select About Treasury, and then there's a link for boards and commissions. And once you get to boards and commissions, you'll scroll down the page to the Law Enforcement Task Force. And that is the link that you can find, that is where you'll find the meeting notice and the link to the uh, live stream video. Okay, and uh, Mr. Wayman and the staff of TCRS, along with our actuaries, have prepared various reports that we've used throughout the past meetings. Those reports are all posted on the website as well for you to look at. And uh, also, I believe, uh, archived footage of the past meetings, the video and audio is on there, too. So if you have any interest in that, and uh, we're pleased that Michael Cox, who's a member of our board, is also a member of the Law Enforcement Task Force and officer with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. So uh, we've got a lot of good participation in this, and I think our last meeting is now scheduled for December 16, right, Jamie? So, of course, that can change depending on what the committee's uh, desire is in terms of the schedule. But we wanted to alert you to that because that's an important uh, undertaking that we're doing there. Also, I want to point out that, um, that we will have future board meetings at the bottom of your agenda are tentatively set for March 31, 2023, and also June 30, 2023. And lastly, I want to point out that we will not have a board education session today after the board meeting, which we normally do. 
each quarter. I know you're disappointed that you won't get your box sandwich and lunch today, but at, uh, at any rate, we appreciate everyone's participation in those very good educational sessions, and they will resume again uh, at the next meeting on March 31, so you can plan for that, all right? Is there any other matter to come before the Board of Trustees at this point? Any other discussion point or matter? All right, seeing none, I want to wish everyone a wonderful holiday season that's upcoming here, and thank you so much for everything you've done for the retirement system and for the state of Tennessee in 2022, and we look forward to an even greater 2023. And uh, I know Commissioner Williams joins me in that, along with all, each of you. Is there a motion to adjourn? All right. Mr. Wormsley moves it and the Commissioner Williams seconds. I thought for a minute y'all wanted to just stay and talk for a long time. All right. Without objection, the Board of Trustees stands adjourned. Thank you and happy holidays to everybody.